You are listening to the Anxiety Podcast, where we support you to overcome anxiety and reduce stress. We will get vulnerable and it will be real. Here's your host, Tim J.P. Collins. Hello and welcome to the Anxiety Podcast. Have I got an interview for you today? Um, excited to have somebody on the guest today. Ryan is his name and he likes to run amongst other things. We will chat to Ryan in a moment. Before we do that, if you haven't been on over to anxietypodcast.com, get yourself over there. Um, you can see on the free tab, you can get a copy of the end anxiety toolkit that includes an audio, a video, an ebook, lots of stuff for you to support you, to help you. Um, Also, we've been having some great conversation and exponential growth recently in our Less Anxiety, More Life Facebook group, our community. Uh, There's a tab for that. If you're on the front page of the website, just scroll down and you'll see a tab. Click that. It takes you right to the page on Facebook and then you can just join up from there. Um, If you're interested in other things, the website is a hub of information. There is one-on-one coaching where you can talk to me directly. There's group coaching, which is called Fear Boot Camp. Um, There's an online course on there for you to take self-study wise. So there's loads of things for you to get involved in, lots of resources. So get stuck in and it will get you on the road to recovery, get you moving towards overcoming anxiety. Okay, so let's talk about Ryan Light. Ryan is coming on the podcast today for a chat and he is uh, a very down-to-earth character He struggled with anxiety for a long time whilst trying to survive in, he was also in the kind of IT world, a bit like myself, Um, went through some OCD related stuff in his younger years, went through anxiety. He'll talk about, you know, some of the things that he suffered with specifically um, and some of the the things that he had to kind of overcome and lean into. Uh, He also goes on to say that he found, you know, running and exercise to be a big release for him and a way that he could, you know, essentially cleanse and talk about all of his issues as he was running along with his friends and kind of like relieve himself of some of those struggles and, and found some freedom there whilst running to be able to share what was really going on in his life. Um, and since then, he's run over 40 half marathons, two full marathons and loads of five and 10 Ks. And he's loving it. He just loves running and, and the challenge and uh, what that brings for him. He now writes a blog, talks about running, coaches running and does lots of stuff in that community. So without further ado, let's chat to Ryan and I will let him go into more detail. Here we go. Okay, so Ryan Light, welcome to the Anxiety Podcast. Thanks for having me. Yeah, great that you could join us. And uh, I met you on Twitter, I think. Is that right? Yeah, that, yeah, I believe that's what we connected at. Yeah. Oh, yep. Um, and I saw your some of the things you were posting on there looked very good and, and uh, obviously focused around the anxiety space. So... Maybe we could start off with you kind of giving us a bit of uh, a bit of a delve into your own personal story. Yeah, sure. Um, so I've been dealing with OCD primarily most of my life. Um, I started having OCD symptoms at a pretty young age. Probably, I think my first OCD episode was probably when I was around eight or nine years old. Mm. And uh, I remember it. I remember it vividly, um, and didn't really say nothing. I thought it was interesting enough. My, my OCD is not the typical um, compulsive disorder where you check locks and you, you the checking things. Mine is pure O, so I deal with more of a, a pure O obsession. So it's more thoughts mm. than anything. Um, so I don't deal with the. the Checking little locks and, and and things of such. I, mine's just pure um, thoughts that that are that are sometimes sometimes very scary in nature and sometimes very scattered. So mm-hmm. they would come at me. Um, uh, I remember the first bout I had was when I was eight years old. Um, as as I grew in my teenage years, it kind of went away and it would come and go, come and go. Um, and then when I was sixteen, um, it really hit me. When I was 16 years old, I had another severe bout that lasted for about a year. Um, but interesting enough, my OCD back then, my thought that was coming at that time was that I was going to be gay. 
right. um, was that was that was a thought that was in my brain, and I came from a family where that was not allowed. Mm-hmm. Um, it was one of those one of those families that um, that unfortunately was uh, not too prone to, to having sons that 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 you know had that uh, orientation. Yeah. So, so with that, with that, with that obsessive piece, you, so your mind essentially just thinks about whatever the you know worst case scenario is, or is yeah, yeah well, it, what, exactly what happens is you you know you have a thought that comes to your brain and and you you try to fight that thought because you're not supposed to have that thought. Mm. But, and I fight that thought, the, 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 the cycle becomes even worse. So what happens is when the cycle becomes worse and you can't get rid of the thought, the anxiety builds in you. Yeah. And as the anxiety builds in you, panic sets in because you can't get away from the thought. Right. Um, so I, I, back then I didn't really have um, associated anxiety or panic attacks. Um, it was mostly a, mostly pure Oh, um, but you know, I, I probably had silent attacks inside of me. I didn't, I didn't physically show the s- symptoms, mm. um, but I, 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 I try to hide that thought from my brain for for a good year. Yeah. Um. So you know, you know, you know, what does a young boy do when that happens? If they go the exact opposite way and they become promiscuous and so on and so forth. So, um, you know, I, you try to combat stuff by doing things that the thought says you, you know, you are, and that's kind of how uh, my teenagers um, kind of came into effect, where things like that would constantly happen to me. Thoughts would just come out to me um, where I would have this anxiety symptoms, not really going to any anxiety attacks, but mostly symptoms around thoughts that would come to me. And now, granted, that would come into, I'd have thoughts around tests or things like that later on in my teenage years. Mm. And then in my mid-30s again, I got hit with um, another bout with, interesting enough, around flying. Mm. And I had a, I had a, um, a, uh, I was going to take a new job in a position where traveling was was going to be um, part of the job. Now, granted, I didn't have, I didn't, I didn't have the job. There was no travel plans associated with me going anywhere, and my obsessive thought was around flying. So my, the thought in my head was, and it was like I was getting to, I was getting ready to go on a flight that day. Like I was, I was, so I had anxiety and fear over flying when I didn't have the job yet. And I had no travel plans in the, uh, in the, in the works, Mm -hmm. but I had the thought like I was going to be traveling. Right. So my thought came in and that started this cycle, this downward cycle for about five or six years of dealing with not, it it no longer was the pure O it turned into full on anxiety and full on panic attacks. Um, where it moved from flying to just about anywhere, anytime, any place, anything would strike up an anxiety or a panic attack, um, and that was kind of how, kind of my backdrop story around what I deal with and, and how I dealt with it. Mm-hmm. And did you ever? Um, was there ever any indication as to what set it off for you? Was the you know, was it? Did they tell you it was genetic, or did you ever get feedback like that? Uh-oh. Well, you know, I have, um, you know, you go to a doctor and what do they do? They, they kind of go to your background and they want to prescribe you, especially if you're a psychiatrist, they want to prescribe you medication and, mm. and they look at your family. And my, I come from a family that has anxiety issues and my mother had, uh, uh, panic attacks and, and, and such. So I, I think some of that is hereditary and some of that is environmental and some of that is, you know, it's a combination of, of things coming together at a certain point in someone's life where things just, it, it just happens. You mm. know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if you heard the recent episode where we we're talking about postpartum depression, um, or postpartum anxiety, but, uh, yeah, the, you call it pure O, which uh, sounds like some kind of drug actually, but, um, <laughs> uh, but, uh, a lot of other people, well, a lot of people in the anxiety community obviously talk about intrusive thoughts, which I guess is similar in, in some respects where you, yeah, that, that's that, that, that would be uh, pure O is pure obsessiveness. You, you, I don't have the compulsion that gets rid of the obsessiveness. Yeah. 
Right. So I don't, you know, uh, and, and I don't know if it would be worse if I had the compulsiveness, right? I think that as, as each individual deals with their own OCD, you know, intrusive thoughts, panic and anxiety, we, we, we deal with things in which, um, is individualized. Mm. Right. So you might have dealt with your anxiety and panic is a little bit different than how I deal with my anxiety and panic. Um, and then our symptoms or the things that we deal with might be a little bit different in the truce of thoughts perspective. A pure O is someone that cannot get away from the, the obsessiveness, right? It's, mm. I'm just constantly obsessing. And now in work, uh, you can see that in my work, like I'll send an email off to somebody. And if I don't get a response, I I wonder, right? The thought comes in my head, or oh, what do they think? Or you know, maybe I should have said this. And I'll read, re- I'll reread my email five to ten times after I sent it. Yeah. So because I'm just obsessing over what I said or how I said it or mistakes. Or I mean, it's just it's silly little things. I just mm. that oh that that spin off and and uh and um get you into a, a tailwind. Yeah, I've been there for the email one. Like I've been there right. for sure. I understand that. Um, I actually, for the podcast, when I first started doing it, I had to re, I re-listened quite a lot. Now I'm, now I'm kind of, I don't know if I'm forcing myself or I'm just getting more comfortable at letting go once I've released it instead of re-listening and making sure I didn't say something inappropriate or say something wrong or misquote somebody. But yeah, it's, uh, it's a challenge for sure. Yeah, most definitely, especially, you know, with us, uh, um, uh, I'm not a perfectionist by any means, but I, you know, it, it, it the way my thought patterns and, and my processes go, I, I'm, I'm quick to act mm-hmm. and, and, and slow to, and slow to, you know, kind of take a breath and just sit back. So if I get an email or so, something that's said or however, I'm quick to act, but I'm slow to, like I said, slow to, slow to take a breather and still you know, think about things for a second before I respond. So, mm-hmm. I do that after the fact. So my OCD kicks in and it just becomes a endless cycle where I, I, I reread things over and over again. Yeah. It's interesting. I was listening to, uh, I can't remember who it was, but it was somebody who's in the public eye a lot. Uh, might have even been Gary Vaynerchuk. I don't know if you know who Gary Vaynerchuk is, but he's a bit of an online personality, but, uh, he was, I think it was him. If not, then it was somebody else. But they were saying they don't ever listen to anything they've ever created. He's like, I, I've never listened to a podcast, uh, a, bl- a vlog or any of these things. They're like, why would I need to listen to it? I said it. <laughs> right. Right. Well, I, you know, even with my website, even with my blogs that I write, it's pretty, it's, I've gotten better to, to your point. I've gotten better over the, over the time that I've, I've blogged about this stuff because mm. uh, you can just get, you get encapsulated in your own, your own fear of, you know, what people think or, or, you know, am I saying things correctly right. or, you know, it, you just get into that endless cycle where I just hit publish. If I have, grammar issues or grammar things that are not said right or however it might be. I'm just like, forget it because I'll yeah. just get lost inside of it and it becomes null and void. Yeah. And then, you know, there's, there's many more people in the world, I believe who have great ideas or have things to share or things that can help and they don't because they are perfectionists. So they are worried about making sure it's a hundred percent before they hit the publish button or before they send it. Right. Um, and if I was like that, I'd never put a video on Facebook. I'd never release a podcast. And, and so I think, yeah, it's, you get if you're if the message is important enough to you, then over time you get gentler on yourself, and you know your audience starts to forgive you the odd hiccup of if you spell something incorrectly or say yeah, something yeah, wrong. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. And I have some I have some grammar folks that you know read my stuff and they they let me go, so which yeah. is a good. <laughs> yeah, I get picked up on it once in a while, and then right. I'm like I wrote that at midnight, <laughs> right. just before I sent it to you. Exactly, half asleep. Yeah. Um, but I also think in the, in the space that we live in, like in, in the anxiety community, I find it, um, liberating to some extent because I feel like if I ever ha if I ever make a big issue with the community and, you know, the listeners who consume this podcast, they're the most forgiving, empathetic people in the right, world, right? Right, right, exactly. Because they, they understand. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If I have like, you know, if I get something wrong and can't talk mid podcast, people will be like, oh, that's okay. Don't worry. Exactly. Right. <laughs> so, um, 
as a result of or after all that stuff came up for you, what approaches did you try to heal yourself? Like, what did you, what did you, you obviously tried medication at some point, did you? Yeah. I mean, I'm still, I still take medication. I think there's nothing wrong with taking medication. I think um, medication does take the, the edge off of things. You know, a lot of people, um, you know, first you got to find the right medication. I think I, I, I spent, a couple of years looking at different medications that just didn't work for me. And it really, it really took my, you know, what I did is I tried to go the natural route, um, mm-hmm. seeing a natural path and taking a boatload of vitamins and, and things that just didn't work for me. Now, some people, it does work and it just didn't work for me. Even the natural path, what I did love about her was she's like, listen, I put, I put you on this. I put you on that. You're taking this. You're taking that. It's not working. Let's get back to conventional medication because that, that, that seemed like it worked. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, I do, I do continue to take, um, uh, medication today um it's an ssri which is very familiar in the in the anxiety community and um interesting enough back in my this was back probably five six years ago now um where my anxiety kind of really around the whole flying thing um mm-hmm. that really started to kick in and it i mean it it got it got bad it got bad to the point where suicidal thoughts would, would come in, right? It's just, I mean, in the anxiety community, you, as as you probably know, you just get to a point where people don't understand you, medication's not working, you can't function. I mean, I'm, I had four kids. I have four kids. My wife stays at home. I'm working at Microsoft. I'm I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to keep up with the with the high tech, you know, industry and working at a, a big corporate. A conglomerate like that, like Microsoft, and I'm dealing with kid issues. Um, my marriage is, you know, so everything was coming at me at once, and I got to a point where I just, I, <laughs> I, I just had enough. I've, I, I just, I had enough. Yeah. And a buddy of mine who um, started running, he was, he. He was uh, my age, and he started running in his mid thirties, late thirties, and um, he asked me to go on a to ride along with him. I so I rode my bike, and he he was he was running. And like so, a scene out of Rocky. Yeah, yeah exactly, <laughs> exactly. And so he ran a, he ran eighteen miles that day, and I rode my bike along with him, wow. and I had the you know, one of the, one of the, probably one of the best conversations I ever had with him mm. uh, during that run. And, uh, you know, I, I thought to myself during that time, I'm like, oh, man, you, you're crazy. You, I don't, I can't get how you can do this. And, and, uh, I just, I just don't understand how you can run this many miles. And, uh, he said, you know, if with the right time and with the right practice, anybody can run this. And I, I was, I was not a firm believer. And, um, interesting enough, after some time of doing some research, I decided to, uh, you know, buy a pair of running shoes and, and, and go out for a run. <laughs> mm. And, um, to be frank with you, that running probably saved my life. I found I found a passion of mine where it it allowed me. So I became a runner. I became. I started um, running, and now I run multiple marathons and half marathons, and I'm a running coach and all this other good stuff around running. Um, and that's where I found my relief, and and I found a, a sport that allowed me to escape escape myself, so to say. Um, allowed me to, to, to get out and kind of just surround myself with not only good friends, because a lot of my good friends run now as well. Um, but then I have the best conversations in it. But I had it, it, it allowed me in my mental uh, lapse where I'm just kind of just kind of doing my thing running, and it really helped me um, energetically, mentally, um, spiritually. It helped me in every facet of my life that gave me the 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 um, the the width to deal with my anxiety, so to say, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, and it sounds like you have multiple things going on at the same time. So you obviously have the the physical benefits of exercise, which which we, we've talked about many times here. But uh, I think one of the things that I you you've said twice, I think already, is the the, the depth or level of conversations you've had whilst you've been running. Yeah, exactly. I've had the, you know, if I, I've had, because, you know, you, if you go on a, 
an hour to two hour to a three hour run. I mean, you're you're basically I'm basically in a conversation with some of my best friends over that time, and so the, you know that's where I really share life. You know, I really share my struggles, what I'm dealing with, and and it allows me to kind of get out because you know a lot of times within anxiety, it's the it's the deep dark secret that you're keeping in mm. that's really stopping you from getting the help that you need and overcoming it. Right? Yeah. I, I spent many years in the corner trying to hide the things that I was doing. Like who wants to, who wants to, you know, tell people that I'm dealing with a thought of becoming a serial killer. I mean, you know what I mean? Like that is embarrassing in itself. Um, and people think you're crazy because, and you become, you know, for me, I'm, I was thinking I was becoming crazy because, you know, because of that thought. So, you know, a lot of times it's, it's an embarrassing situation. Um, so it comes to a point where you kind of lock yourself in and, um, and as you know, with the anxiety community, it's, it's in with anxiety, the more, at least for me, the more I get out and the more I'm open about my, my situation and my struggles, the less effect it has on me. Now, is, does it go away totally? No. Do I still have panic attacks? Yes. Do I still have my fears and I still have anxiety? I still do. I just learn how to deal with them differently now. Mm. Uh, than I once did. Yeah. Yeah. You've like, you've, uh, I always say that, you know, when you're in the midst of it in the early days, you, you're just reacting to it. But as you put the tools in place, you've now, you know, your, your foundation is, is solidly there. So when you, you know, when you get a bit of wind, it doesn't blow your house over it. It just rattles the windows a bit, but you're still, yeah, yeah. still standing. Yeah. Exactly. And what, and what I found was, you know, if I'm, if I'm feeling anxious or I'm feeling my OCD is just, you know, just full throttle, if I take some time to go out for me or on, if I do a run or something like that, it's, it, it subsides. It doesn't go away totally, but allows me to kind of get my, get, get a break, so to say. Um, and then, you know, it, if I just allow the thought to go through and allow it to work its way through my system, so to say, it, it will eventually go away. Mm. Um, so yeah, that's where I found a lot of relief. I think that, um, you know, obviously you've talked about this in your podcast before, but exercise is a good thing. Um, getting around folks that, that are, that are open to you having that kind con- those types of conversations, um, allowed me also allows me to kind of get my relief as well. So it was interesting what, what I expected when I, when I had those intrusive thoughts around serial killing, when I, when I, when I told my wife, it it was interesting that this big relief came off of me. The response I thought I'd get from her in to be frank, uh, a, a response of disgust mm. is what I was th- is what I thought I would get from her. I got the exact opposite with uh, with a um, with a, a a loving tenderness that kind of lifted up lifted lifted the weight off of me. Mm. And it it really um, it, that kind of it, it took me for a loop. I wasn't expecting that kind of response from from anybody, right? Especially my wife, who had who now had two kids. Um, you know, three and one or whatever, how old they were, I thought she'd pick them up and run. Um, yeah. But that's the, you know, she, she, know, you know, she knew that I had anxiety and that was part of my anxiety. Um, so it was, it was those types of things. And nowadays now, if I just let it out, have conversations like I'm having with you or have a run and have a conversation or, or whatever it might be, it, it kind of, it loses its grip on you. Yeah. I love a few things you said in the last little bit, which is, you know, first of all, Sharing our vulnerabilities takes the, takes the, the pressure off of us to, to maintain this secret, which is really, you know, trying to maintain a secret is painful for anxiety sufferers because you're, you know, any inkling there is for it to squeak out and for somebody to find out and embarrass you, it's kind of looking for that opportunity all the time. But one of the other things you said, which I think is, is super important and totally aligned to my approach is that when you, you know, first of all, you took a break for yourself to, to nurture yourself to go and do some exercise when you're feeling at your worst. And that gives you a bit of a break. Um, but also what you said about allowing the thought to just work its way through the system. And I think that's just critical for us to highlight because so much of our natural, uh, or not even natural is probably not the right word, but so much of our inclination or our response to anxiety is to try and push it away and fight it because it's such a primal, 
kind of gross feeling, but the reality is is that the 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 by embracing it as I always say or taking the thought in your case and processing it and just letting it dissipate and kind of pass through um is the way to is the way to get rid of it it's not you're not going to beat it and and get rid of it yeah it's, exactly i think yeah ex- exactly uh, it doesn't have a grip any longer right if i just let the i think of um you know if i envision something i think of a stream and I think of a piece of wood kind of going down the stream and that thought being that that piece of wood and that wood just floating on by, right? Just let it float on by. Mm-hmm. Now, that floating on by might take a couple of days. Yeah. And it might take a week or it might take a, it might take an hour. It might take however, however how long. But I find that if I don't fight it and just let it go through its, its you know, its go through my system, so to say, it will, it will eventually dissipate. Mm-hmm. And then the next thought that happens becomes a little bit more less grip on me. Yeah. So it, it, if I just let it go and let it do its thing, rather than you know fight or flight, um, I, I it will it will eventually go away. Now, granted, that's a lot harder than to do than to, you know what I mean. Yeah. It takes some practice. It takes some it takes some willpower. It takes some time. It takes some understanding and things like that. So, um, but it's that's what I found that really helps relieve my situations. Yeah. And, and lately I've been talking about the three C's. I'm not sure if you've seen that anywhere, but I haven't seen it yet. No. Yeah. So I talk about curiosity. So, um, you know, kind of why is this showing up right now? I wonder what, if there's a message here or, or, you know, I am in fact safe. So it's kind of irrelevant. So curiosity, I think is just a, a brilliant word. Um, and then courage, which is kind of what we're talking about. So courage to just, be all right with hanging out in the space where it's a little bit uncomfortable, but you're you're kind of letting the piece of wood float on by, right? You're not trying to stop it. You're not trying to pick it up and throw it. You're just letting it go. Um, and then the last C stands for compassion, which is again, be gentle on yourself. Like this might, like you said, it might take two days. It might take some time. Don't try and rush it out the door. So. It's, yeah, exactly. Those 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 are those are really good keys right there to use. Yeah. And and for me, I think that um, you know part of my part of part of my faith journey is is you understanding like you like you said your first thing is like okay why is this coming up like do I have am I am I overextending myself am I you know let me learn from this mm. around you know, why is this coming up now sometimes the truth of thoughts just they just hit you out of the blue and you're like, <laughs> right. Yeah, and it's no like, good it's, reason for there's them. no good reason. Right. They yeah. just come and they're totally, they're totally wacky where you're like, you kind of laugh about it. Right. Mm-hmm. So you, and there's other times in which you're like, okay, what am I, what do I need to learn from this situation? Um, am I, you know, like I said, am I overextending myself? Am I not taking the time out to do my exercises or my, you know, my breathing techniques or whatever it might be? You know what yeah. I mean? It's like, let me, let me kind of figure out why this is coming up at this time. So I think your first C is, is critical as well. Yeah. And it's there because, you know, as, as well as we try, you know, uh, and again, something else I've talked about before a lot is that, you know, uh, our fear comes from our amygdala, which, which, uh, is, happens in our brain before our thought process kicks in. So the whole point of curiosity is to say, well, hang on a minute. Instead of just throwing some adrenaline on, on the fire, why don't I actually see what's up? And maybe it is because you just got off an international flight, or maybe it's because you had three glasses of red wine last night and you're a bit hungover, you know? Right, exactly. And then if you can, if you can connect with any of those things, then there's, there's part of your solution. And as humans, we all like to connect things together. And then sometimes there's nothing and you just have to be like, all right, well, this is just good old fashioned anxiety. or OCD. Exactly. Exactly. Um, but if you can connect it to something, then it allows you to break up the pattern a little bit. Exactly. Like me, myself, I was telling the client earlier on today, I went out this past, I don't drink very often anymore, but I'm not, I'm not teetotal either. And, uh, I went out for dinner on Friday night and it was one of those situations where there was kind of bottles of wine on the table, but they weren't really belonging to any individuals. They were just being passed around and the waiter would fill your glass up. And so I just lost track a little bit of how much I had to drink and I didn't feel drunk when I left the restaurant, but I woke up the next morning and I had a bit of a headache and I was like, Oh God, I don't feel good. And, and so, yeah, I felt more anxious than I normally would. And, you know, anytime during that day I felt anxious, I, I go straight to my three C's and the first one's like, 
why am I feeling anxious? Oh yeah, because you had probably four glasses or five glasses of red wine last night and you normally do two. So um, it's uh, it's useful to do that. Yeah, it's, yeah exactly. Yeah. So I totally agree with you. And I think that sometimes, you know, we, you the vicious cycle can happen, right? Where you feel anxious and you, you don't do that first C or you don't, you know, it, it becomes a vicious cycle where the anxiety kicks in and you – you wonder why you're anxious, which makes you more anxious, and then you wonder why you're more why, wonder why you're anxious, and it makes you more anxious. So it's it's this endless cycle where, you know, you, you just and then the, that anxiety, at least for me in those situations, would turn into a panic attack. Right. Uh, and you know, it, and I learned my panic attacks just again, like like I talked about before. You let them come. Sometimes they last two minutes. Sometimes they last twenty minutes, and just let them do that. I mean, I've been running mm. and had a full blown panic attack. Mm. So I've been like, like so I, exactly. <laughs> and, and, and trying your heart, you know, your heart's elevated already. You're sweating already. And, you know, and you can't, you know, you have a, you know, you're, you're running. So your breathing's off anyway. So it, it's interesting, but you know, you kind of just let it, let it take its course and let it do its thing. And it'll eventually go away. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I did, I mean, interestingly thinking about that on, you know, with the last C talking about compassion on Saturday, I just thought, you know what, I'm just gonna uh, take, you know, take it easy and not try and do too much as well. Right, right, exactly. And sometimes, you, sometimes your body needs that break as well. Yeah, yeah. And one, and one part of that is I went out for, um, I went out for a nice walk and you know looked at the trees and listened to the birds and you know disconnected myself a little bit from being online and that definitely helped. Definitely yeah, it definitely helps. Most definitely. Yeah. I always go back to this because people always think this, they're always looking for a miracle cure for anxiety or, or depression or anything else. And just some of the fundamentals in terms of take time for yourself because you're worth it and go for a walk and see what noises you can hear. I mean, it's so basic. It's unreal, but it has a massive effect on everybody, me included. Yeah, definitely. That's why I like, that's, that's one of my things about running. I'm a, you know, I'm, a, I'm originally from New York, so I, I'm Couldn't a city, I, I'm a city. Well, <laughs> interesting enough, I've lived in Seattle for 20 years. So I'm, I'm a, I've, I'm from Seattle with a New York accent. Now I live in Atlanta. So, oh, yeah. um, uh, now, now my Southern twine might come out. <laughs> exactly. So, but I, that's why I love running, right? I love the, I love the, Everything from the crosswalk lights to mm. the horns to just everything about the – now, interesting enough, a lot of people find anxiety about the city and stuff like that, right? I'm mm. the exact opposite. I get thrived, so oh, I yeah. love the, the the city life and so on and so forth. So, it, it, like you said, it's it's really focusing on those little things that allow you to that kind of give you that mental break. Yeah, when I was in England um... – and uh, last time and struggling with anxiety a bit, I would run and I would run through central London and I, I love it. Like I, I would run through like Soho and run to Buckingham Palace and I just felt like I was in a video game. It just felt right, amazing. Right, right, right. Yeah, like, exactly. Because everybody else is walking and you're running and it's kind of tighter streets and busy and yeah, stuff. You exactly. Feel like you're, one of the best runs I've ever had uh, was when I was in Paris. It was just amazing with the hustle and bustle of the city and these small, compact streets. Yeah. Um, I just, you know, it, it, a lot of people find anxiety in that. I find relief in that. So, yeah. you know, each, each his own. And um, But, yeah, I think that to your point where you can, you know, take those breaks and, and get those mental breaks, whatever it might be, if it's mm. – if it's getting out in nature and, and experiencing that, that's great. If it's getting out in the city and experiencing that, that's great. Yeah. So I think that to you, I think that's that's critical. Yeah, and I've, I also have uh, I've done one marathon actually. I ran the London Marathon. Um, I think it was two thousand and seven. Um, uh, and but I've done many half marathons, and and for me, I really enjoy the community and supportive nature of that. And I think you know. If you go back hundreds or thousands of years into the past, um, well, first of all, anxiety probably didn't exist in the same way it does today. But for right. people who were feeling anxious, they were probably taken care of and talked to by the community. Now I think people are a lot more insular and they think they're broken and therefore they just keep it a secret, which, as we know, makes it worse. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I love the running community and I, you know, I always joke before I even got into 
podcasting or coaching or anything around anxiety, I'd always joke around running and say like, you can run a half marathon and you'll have like three new friends by the end of it. Because yeah, exactly. I would just, well, I'd find somebody and I'd be, um, oh, we're about the same pace. And then, and then you're like, okay, here's my life story. And uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. You go. Exactly. I, it's interesting you say, I, I, uh, I ran my well, last half marathon. I ran in Nashville and I was, you know, trotting along and I, bumped into some woman that wanted to keep pace with me and we talked for a good hour and a half. We knew all, we knew all everything about each other in that hour and a half. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you meet your, I met some, some of my best friends running. So yeah, I swear as well. There's, I've never thought about this until right now that I'm talking to you, but I, there must be something and it's probably not isolated to running, but there must be something about physical endurance and feeling some discomfort or pain and vulnerability um, because I, I, you know, I, I believe that whilst running and being uncomfortable, I've been way more open because you're kind of already being vulnerable by like, yeah, oh yeah, God, exactly. this is, exactly. we're in this struggle together. So yeah, yeah, we might exactly. as well tell each other everything. Yeah, ex- ex- exactly. I, it, it's a great point. Like, you know, some of these, you know, if you, when you were training for your marathon, like some of these 20 milers will go on, we'll have our best conversations ever yeah. because we're like dead tired. Like, yeah. you know, we just, we're totally broken. Um, yeah. and we just, you know, we just pep each other up by just having great conversations. Yeah. We might die. So I'm going to tell you all my secrets <laughs> right now. Right, exactly. And I think that's kind of my, that's kind of my, 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 you know, my niche is how do you, you know, how do you incorporate, you know, especially anxiety sufferers with endurance sports, right? Because I think there's a lot of us that deal with anxiety and, and don't have, or, you know, they never thought of doing any type of endurance sports because they're so, you know, for me, when I, when I started running, I was so worried and into me that mm-hmm. I didn't think I could walk outside the house. Yeah. Right. Cause you know, I, I was, you feel so, and I get pinged on Twitter all the time around, you know, you, you know, you felt me overcome this and thank you for the, your, your content on your site. And I'm dealing with this and I'm struggling with that. And this lady just pinged me last week around being on her, you know, on her last breath mm-hmm. and she was talking, she was talking suicide to me. And I'm like, Oh, well, you know, hold up. You know, the, the, these are the types of things in which, so I kind of related back to her around because she was dealing with depression and, you know, depression just, you know, people get to the last wit. And so nice. it's, I get that all the time on, on Twitter and, and Facebook. So it's, it's good that, that we're out here talking about this kind of stuff and, and people do have a, to, people can reach out. Yeah. And that's part of my whole vision with this is to uh, let people know that there's, you know, there's support out there. There's an alternative, you know, there's an alternative route than just sitting there suffering. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I wanted to walk through some of your strategies for sure. anxiety relief because uh, you got some cool ones on here and, and uh, people who are listening to this are, are always interested in things that they can do to, uh, to support themselves. So we talked a lot about exercise. I don't know if there's anything to add to that apart from I would say, you know, um, don't feel like you have to run out and do a marathon, but just yeah, exactly. anything to start with is useful. It, yeah, exactly. I think that even, you know, if, if running is, is, a um, an option, that's great. I think a wonderful sport, but just doing anything, cycling, walking, whatever it might be. I think that, uh, getting some, um, endorphins kicking in would, would help, mm. uh, leave some of our, some of our angst. Yeah, and actually, like this last week, I was traveling. I was in a hotel, and there wasn't a gym in the hotel. Um, and the old Tim would have said, "Fair enough," and I would have gone to the breakfast buffet. But right. on this occasion, I uh, I just said, "I'm going to do some stuff in my room." Right? I had this hotel room, plenty of space, so I wrote down on a piece of paper. I did push ups, sit ups, dips off of a chair, and air squats. And I just said, "I'm going to do." 10 sets of 10, so 10 sets of t- yeah. 100 of each until I finished. It probably took me 25 minutes. By the time I finished, I had a good little sweat on and I, but I felt amazing. Like I, yeah, exactly. So Just good. get endorphins kicking in. They, uh, the endorphins will override the amygdala, the amygdala. You know what I mean? Like it yeah. will, it will, it will give you that, that, uh, that, um, for me, I get the runners high when I run. So it's, it's, um, the endorphins just kick in allows me to feel good, so to say. Yeah. But even doing like jumping jacks and, and things like that, I mean, just getting the, the heart pumping a little bit will subside a lot of issues. Yeah. Um, just getting your mind off of something. Yeah. 
Um, one of the other ones you talked about was distracting your senses. Yeah, I think for me, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's honing in on, on the distractions, so to say. So it's and taking that seriously. Um, like when I'm out running, especially by myself, I will, I will, I will hone in on the, 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 the crosswalk blinking or mm-hmm. things that, you know what I mean? Like things that you normally just wouldn't really listen to or hone in on. I, I think for me that that allows me to kind of distract myself um, from situations and even being at home. Um, I think a distraction is, is, is good as well, whether that's reading a book or, you know, keeping your mind, I'm a chess player, so I'll, I'll get on chess and I'll play a couple of games of chess. So I think those types of distractions help me. That makes me anxious thinking about playing yeah. chess. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, my, my, you know, depending on how I'm feeling, um, it's not, you know, especially if I'm losing, it's not always a good yeah. thing. But I think, yeah, I think, you know, any distraction, but honing in on those, honing in on those distractions um, works well for me. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, um, I mean, if you think about it, if you break it down, like, you know, meditation, uh, is really about connecting with what you can hear, what you can, f- they always, in meditation, they always talk about feel yourself against the seat or, you know, how does your body feel and, and notice the things around you. And, um, just yesterday I went for a walk with my son and we're walking down this path to the ocean. And I just said, I said, just stop and, and let's count the th- different things you can hear. And we heard like a woodpecker and a stream running and leaves rustling and wind. And we wouldn't have heard any of it if we just kept walking and talking. Right, right. It's, exactly. And I think that's where, you know, that's where you're honing in on the, on those distractions. Like you're actually listening for those things. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where you can use your anxiety superpower for good stuff because, I believe that anxiety gives us this extra sensory perception of being able to notice and feel more things than other people. So you might as well use it for your enjoyment and actually notice. Exactly. Stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, very cool. Um, magnesium. Yeah, you know, magnesium, um, for me, it, it, uh, it's a, uh, it's a, a vitamin that works to kind of, it, it works as though to bring me down, so to say. Mm. Um, you know, it bring it, it was, well, especially in those long runs, it works for recovery for me. So it's a double dose yeah. for muscle recovery, but then it also, it's a calming agent as well. Mm-hmm. Also, I use it as a, as a calming agent when I'm, when I'm, uh, when I'm anxious. Yeah. Also good for sleep. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, I take, uh, I take a multivitamin and I take magnesium and that's about it. Yeah. So if you if you're if you're uh at least for me if I'm anxious or if I'm really if I'm tired but I can't sleep, mm-hmm. it I use magnesium to help me to help me kind of bring down my body and calm down my body yeah. and really to me to to really kind of just take a break. Yeah. And uh, about with regard to an anxiety disaster plan, is that kind of having something ready to go? Well, I think it. Well, <laughs> You know, I think for me it was more of you know if something kicks in and having having kind of a plan on what you're going to do, right? Mm. Um, you know, I think a lot of times what happens is we we you know anxiety kicks in or panic kicks in, and you you know your first indication is all right, am I going to run or if I'm going to fight this? Mm-hmm. Right, and if you know the action plans you're going to take, I think that that will allow you to to kind of know what's going to happen, right? So you you you're yeah. forward thinking around, so it loses its power, right? You know that yeah. okay, I'm gonna this is what I'll do. I'm going to fight through it, or I'm going to go take a walk. And sometimes fighting through it is taking a walk, mm-hmm. or going on a run, or distracting yourself. So it's you know it's knowing what to do. Yeah. Um, when something like that happens. Yeah. Very cool. Um, and then you also, you also mentioned keeping a journal as well. So is that something that you do? Yeah, I keep, well, I'm not as good as it used to be. Um, but I think keeping a journal on how you feel, uh, what you felt like and what the trigger was, because understanding the triggers is key. Yeah. Uh, at least for me, it's, you know, am I in, are these triggers, are they, um, is there a pattern here of triggers? Mm-hmm. So I think that 
you know, writing that stuff down and keeping a journal of that stuff is important. Um, I'm not as good as I used to be with it. I, I interesting enough, I write about it and I'm not, I'm not following my own program. Yeah. But I think that's, I think that's key as well. I think keeping a journal, um, helps it, it helped me see if I was having any patterns and then to see if what relief I got based off that trigger. Yeah. Right. So if I had something trigger me and what I did for the relief of that, that kind of had me, allowed me to go back in history and do some analysis on, okay, you know, if this happens, maybe I should do this. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think for a lot of us, um, just writing it down, unless you realize that it's kind of not necessary a lot of the time. Um, right. Right. Exactly. I, again, I think all of this stuff is, 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 you want you want the anxiety to lose its power on you, right? And so mm-hmm. a lot of these things that you do, it, it loses its power because it doesn't have a grip, right? You're doing something to help yourself overcome the anxiety. So as you help yourself overcome the anxiety, it loses its grip to eventually, hopefully it will, you know, for me, it doesn't go away totally, but it, it helps relieve it. And then, you know, instead of having a 20-minute panic attack, I have a two-minute panic attack. Yeah. So it kind of just, for me, it helped me kind of alleviate and um, it loses its grip on me. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes I recommend people just write, you know, just make a list of all the things they're worried about and, and just for the purposes, if nothing else, of getting them out of your head and onto paper. Um, because there's, there's pretty good research that shows once you write something down, your brain feels less uh, pressure to retain that information. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, exactly. Yep. So it's kind of logical, right? It's like it's like making a sh- if you go to the store and you haven't made a list of all the food you're going to buy, you're probably going to come back with loads of random stuff. If you're like me, um, especially tea and dark chocolate, I'll always get that. Right. Um, <laughs> but if you make a list, you're going to get the stuff on the list. So it's you know write it down. You don't have to remember it, and it takes the pressure off of it. Uh, exactly. Exactly. Paper. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. Um, one of the other, I just wanted to see if there's any kind of key ones. One of the other articles that you wrote, and I will put a link to your blog on the show notes for this episode so people can check it out because there's some lots of good info on there. Um, but one of the other f- things you talked about was some, some key ways to, to fight and overcome fear. Uh-huh. Um, and one of those that I was looking, checking out was breathing. So is there, uh, is that something that you've used in the past for? For this reason, yeah, I mean, I, I use that even today, um, where you know I, I really focus on the belly breathing, mm. um, and I allow myself to really feel myself. It, it's funny you said that, it's funny you with your um, um, with the things we talked about with your C's, right? It's right, it's three like C's, yeah. three C's. It, breathing for me, it allowed now it's obviously you got to learn how to breathe correctly through you know. I, through the nose, out through the mouth, and make sure you're belly breathing. Mm. Um, but when I focused on that, it becomes a. Uh, it's interesting how much it calms you. Yeah. And there's proven, you know, there's science behind it, and there's tons of blogs on it. Yeah. Uh, where if you learn how to breathe, and what I started doing is I started. I I, I would do it without even having anxiety or panic or something like that. Right. It's like mm. you know. Before our call today, I, I took some deep breaths mm-hmm. right, just to calm myself down around the conversation. So it's, yeah. I think it's, it, uh, you know, for me, it, it really helped me um, and it helps me still um, in breathing. Yeah, and I I totally agree. Um, I've got a YouTube video that I always share with people on how I believe the right way to breathe is, but it's exactly the way you're talking, which is I always kind of say to people, you know, rest your hand just on top of where your belt would be. Exactly. Um, and uh, I still that, do that today. But if I'm about to, if I'm in a meeting and I'm feeling a bit anxious or if I'm going to public speak and I need to get ready for it, then I that's where I go. My hand's always sat there kind of making sure my belly's moving and making sure I'm breathing through my nose. And uh, I think just being conscious of it. I mean, one thing that I did um, just by being conscious of it is that I retrained myself to sleep with my mouth shut. Um, which is, which is kind of weird, but after learning so much about how important breathing is, um, and, you know, we're supposed to breathe through our noses, in through our noses anyway, because it, you know, conditions the air from a moisture point of view and gets the temperature right. 
Um, and you know, if you watch babies sleep, they've always breathed through their nose. They always exactly. diaphragmatically breathe. They, they're perfect. We're perfect when we come out. We just screw ourselves up over time. So. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but just by like consciously, when I close my eyes at night, laying down by shutting my mouth and starting to get a nice rhythm through my nose, I my wife says, "Yeah, you breathe through your nose all the time when you're asleep." Yeah, it's, it's exactly. You know, interesting in my <laughs> – what's kind of funny is I one of my pure thoughts, one of my true thoughts is I was going to start breathing. Right. So, you know, it, it was it was interesting where I would – if I didn't feel myself breathe, like if I wasn't consciously feeling myself breathe, mm. I would get anxiety over it. Mm. So, it, it, you know, it, it <laughs> that went on for a little while as well, but, it you know, it, it – uh, Breathing helped me overcome my breathing anxiety, if that made sense. Yeah. Um, well, but one, yeah. Of the, one of these techniques in this, I read this book, which was actually, it wasn't about panic. I think it was about overcoming asthma. Um, and I did overcome asthma, but more through diet change. Like I cut out gluten and, uh, and dairy predominantly. And I think that cleared up a lot of my inflammatory asthma related stuff. Exactly, but, yeah. Um, but one of the methods in this book, I think it's called the Bateko method. I might be pronouncing that wrong. Um, but they said to practice breathing through your nose that you could actually tape your mouth shut when you sleep. Um, so put like a little bit of, you know, painter's tape type tape across your lips so that you force yourself to breathe through your nose. And that, that was a bit freaky for me, but yeah, I bet. I, I never tried that one. That's interesting though. Yeah. But I think, I think, you know, breathing is, is I think for us anxiety, um, suffer, sufferers, I think breathing, learning how to breathe correctly. Mm does really help. I think it's one of the best free easiest things that you can do day one is is just notice the fact that when you're panicking you're going to be chest breathing up and down. Um you're going to have short rapid breaths which is going to, you know, increase with your heart rate and and all the rest of it. So the science that you're talking about is engaging our parasympathetic nervous system exactly slow our heart rate down by making sure that we get the right balance of oxygen and, and carbon monoxide and exactly and you-, you know it's interesting enough that you know when i learned how to breathe correctly dealing with my anxiety it really helped me in my endurance sport as well mm. so i can literally if my heart rate is too elevated at some whatever pace i can bring it down by breathing through my nose out through my mouth and doing belly breathing Mm -hmm. um yeah it's really interesting how it does and i i I really saw you can really see the effects of it because of of the the sport that i'm doing is an elevated heart rate right but i can bring the heart rate down by the way i breathe well yeah and the fact that you know hyperventilation or rapid chest breathing also makes people feel lightheaded, which exactly. also, by the way, makes you feel anxious because it's the same kind of feeling, like dizziness yeah. or vertigo is, you know, like a panic attack feeling, right? So, exactly. Um, so that's why, if for no other reason than that, avoiding that symptom is going to make you feel better. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Um, one of the other ones I picked up from your list there was um, was facing your fears, and I always I always talk about exposure and disclosure, are two of my f- favorite words, which are you know facing your fears and talking about it. So maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, you know what? Like we talked about in the beginning, um, you know what I did for my uh, for my OCD. In the beginning is I it, it started to um, it started to make sense to me around. You know, this is not me. I kind of get, I kind of get this, right? Mm-hmm. So, and with flying, you know, what I had to do with flying was go fly. Yeah. And so it's those types of things in which, you know, I think facing our fears and facing the things that that are stopping us, um, eventually, again, I think as anxiety suffer suffers, we want to lose. We want the anxiety to lose its grip. The way. It, we allow it to lose its grip is doing the very thing that we have, we have anxiety about. Mm-hmm. You know, I used to have anxiety about, you know, getting in front of people and, and speaking. Now don't get me on a podium because you can't get me off. Yeah. So it was like those things in which I, you know, I just got to, you know, it's just the things that I wanted to face and, and, and had to face. And now it just loses its grip. Yeah. So I think that, you know, I think that's key is, is doing those things in which you don't want to do. Yeah. You have to kind of force yourself to do. Yeah, and repetition is a beautiful thing. I mean, you know, practice makes perfect, and and the more exactly. you put yourself in that. I mean, listen, the first the first ever episode of the Anxiety Podcast, 
my heart was racing. I was, you know, internally thinking I'm not good enough. Who's going to listen? Blah, blah, blah. Like all of those things. Now I'm up to episode 90, whatever it is. And, you know, I, I just don't feel like that anymore. Right, right, right. Cause you get, you got a level of comfort in doing what you're doing, even though you're anxiety about it in the beginning. Yeah. I can still, <laughs> uh, you know, if I'm, when I first get on, I might still feel it a little bit, but now I kind of, I'm, I use that as energy and I'm like, okay, this is good. Cause it means that I'm engaged. I'm focused. I'm on. Um, but in terms of being fearful of the actual process, I'm not, I'm just not anymore because I've done it so much that I'm just comfortable with thinking on my feet. I know I'll always have enough questions. I know that if, you know, technically things go wrong, then we just have to deal with that, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think that, you know, and if people would take that same approach and that, that suffer from anxiety, if they just take that, take that approach and facing their fears. Now, granted, I had, <laughs> I had a support system around me, right. That allowed mm. me to, allowed me the grace that I needed to, to face my fears, especially and specifically around flying. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, it, it, people knew how I, and people kind of, I let it out and it lost the script, but it really didn't lose the script until I got on a plane. Now, do I still, if I was flying tomorrow, would I still be anxious today? Yeah, probably would still be anxious. Um, so it doesn't, it, it's not gone totally, but it mm. doesn't have a grip where I don't want to attend my dad's funeral because I'm scared to get on a plane. Yeah, it's not dictating your life. It's exactly, it's not controlling my life. It, it, I still allowed myself to to kind of walk through these things um, and face my fears. I just wanted to ask you because I work with a lot of people one on one who are working corporate jobs. Um, so, did you disclose what's going on for you at work? Did it did it come up in that place or not? You know, I I didn't. Um, it's not not really. I, well, I left Microsoft, so. Um, it wasn't really, it really didn't come up in, in, at work. So to say. I didn't tell anybody at work yeah. and I really only have been open about my anxiety issues over the past five years. Mm -hmm. So now it's like, you know what? Everybody knows. And you know, I'm, I'm kind of open about it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I haven't ever really, you know, there's, there was a, there was a couple of years there where I probably should have took a break. Yeah. <laughs> Just for a, just you know maybe some short term disability just to get my wits about me, mm -hmm. um, but uh, I didn't um, and I still kept my job interesting enough so I you know I still worked through it. So if you could go back, would you have taken like a, a bit of time off? <laughs> yeah, you know I probably would have. I think that you know th there was a year of my life I just don't remember. Right. I just I just don't. I had anxiety and panic every day. From the moment I, moment I woke up to the moment I went to bed. Mm -hmm. I mean, just full on. I could never give it down from a level 10. I was at a level 10 the entire day. And there's literally a year I, I just don't remember. Mm -hmm. And so I don't even know how I kept my job. I don't know how I kept my marriage. I don't know how I kept friends. I don't know how I did anything for that entire year. I just, I, if you ask me questions about it, I just, I don't remember it. Yeah. I was at state of anxiety all the time, every day. Yeah. You know what, though, I think I listen to that and I'm like, you know, the, the, the strength that you have to, to deal with that and still on the outside make things look like they're okay. It shows how like resourceful and amazing we are as, as people to be able to get through that struggle, right? You couldn't yeah. solve the anxiety at that time, but to actually keep going, that's, that's serious courage, you know? Yeah. I, th I think for me, I think that, um, you know, I, you know, I had four kids and, and I was married and my wife stayed at home. So I was kind of the quote unquote breadwinner. And, and, you know, it, it, it uh, no pressure, uh, right? No pressure. Yeah, I mean, exactly. <laughs> I, mean, I was working at, I was working for Xbox and Microsoft and, you know, they were just coming out with new products. And, and so a lot of things were coming together in a head and, you know, cut, trying to move up the corporate pyramid and, and doing all those things that you, know, you just, you kind of lose sight of, of life, so to say. And, you know, I kept my bearings about me though. <laughs> I, just, mm. I don't remember any of it, to be honest with you. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. You know, I just, I just don't remember it at all. Yeah. And I'm, if you know, if you if you were talking to my wife, she'd tell you, you know, every detail about that year and how bad it was. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, it's it was a 
it's, uh, yeah, I appreciate those remarks. I think I was resourceful. I think it made me um, stronger in really understanding what people go through um, that are dealing with that. So I think the mm. compassion side of me and um, the openness now, um, you know, again, if I look back at that time, I say to myself, okay, you know, what did I learn from that? And, you know, what I, what I learned from that is never to do that again. Yeah. Right. If I get myself in a situation like that again, I need to open up and and um and get the help I needed. Mm. But to answer your question, I would definitely would have took a couple of months off, and I don't see anything wrong with that no. uh, to get to get your to you know, get get my wits about me. That's what it's there for. Right? Exactly. Yep. Exactly. Because I literally, I mean, I I was thinking about jumping off a flipping bridge back then. I was, I mean, I was plotting it out, like how am I do this? Where my wife would still get the money from the insurance, but you, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I mean, it, it was it was crazy thoughts like that. Yeah. The one the 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 point I'd like to uh, to end on because I think it's just uh, it just comes up all the time is is something you wrote about not aiming for perfection. Yeah, I think that's I think that's key. I think that you know we're 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 frail individuals. I think we fail all the time, and I think you know if we fail forward, um, that's key. Mm. Um, you know, and and I think that to to what you've talked about before as well is you know you got to be you, you got to be easy on yourself. You can't take everything literal, and you can't you gotta. I go by a quote that says excellence is the standard, but grace is the word, mm. right? So I, I, I look to achieve excellence, but if I fail, I allow grace to kick in. And, you know, it's, it's just, it's, it's just something that I kind of live by. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that's important for folks that, that, um, that, you know, striving for perfection, that's great, but we're not going, we're, we're frail individuals and we're going to fail. Yeah. And I think if we can learn from those failures and fail forward, um, it, even in our anxiety situations, right? It's, you know, oh, you know, if something kicks in and something happens again, um, it, you know, I can't feel bad about it. It's just, you know, it is what it is. And, and, uh, you know, I use the techniques that I've learned over my time to deal with those situations mm -hmm. and not feel bad about it, right? I think that's where, I think that's where um, anxiety gets a grip, and it, and it and it can just choke you out by allowing you to to kind of become this hurt soul that that, that cowers in the corner because you feel like a failure and you feel guilty and things you know guilt 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 is the worst because because it just you know it it becomes a pitch uh, an habitual guilt mm. when you feel guilty about not even understand what you're feeling guilty about yeah. Yeah, which is why for so so many people it kind of results in lack of self esteem or lack of confidence or self worth or one of those things, you know, where you just don't feel worth it. Yeah, yeah, you don't feel exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think that understanding that you're not perfect and and as long as you fail, you fail forward. If you fail forward, that's what's key. Yeah, absolutely. Well. Ryan, I just want to say thanks very much for coming on today. I've loved the conversation. I think there's huge amounts of value in what we've talked about, and I'm sure people will really enjoy listening to it. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Tim. I appreciate the conversation. All right. All the best, my friend. Thanks, bud. Bye-bye. Take care. All right, bye. There you go. Hope you enjoyed Ryan's story. As I said at the start, very down-to-earth guy, very open to sharing for the benefit of other people, and you can tell that by his total transparency and just willingness to to go into detail about his own story because uh, he knows it's going to help other people. So thanks again, Ryan, for coming on. Much appreciated from all of us in the uh, Anxiety Podcast community. Um, if you have any show suggestions, any questions, any feedback, go to anxietypodcast.com, click on the contact page. You can fill the form out, which comes directly through to me. Uh, you can also send me an email from there if you have any questions. Um, or anything you just want me to go into a bit more detail about. And remember, until next time, less anxiety, more life. Thank you for listening to the Anxiety Podcast. For more information, go to theanxietypodcast.com.